Hello everyone, I hope you're all doing well. Um, I'm just carrying on where I left off last time. Knowing how little the Carters were to be trusted to pass on messages, Miss Minton had sent the note for Maya to Furo, and one of the Count's servants was ordered to take it to his hut. Good news, Miss Minton had written. I'll tell you everything in the morning. I'm staying overnight at the Kaminsky's because I have some business to see to in the morning. Tell the Carters I'll be back at midday, but tell them nothing else. Furo would make certain that Maya got the note. She had seen how the Indians guarded Maya since Finn went away. She was rolling up her napkin when there was a commotion at the door, and the Count, who had been supervising the loading of one of his ships, came quickly into the room, followed by Professor Glastonbury, already badly out of breath. The Count went straight to his wife and spoke to her hurriedly in Russian, but Miss Minton had caught the word Carter and risen to her feet. Oh, my dear, the Curtis took. C counters turned to her. It's bad news, I'm afraid. There's been a fire in the Carter's bungalow. The house is destroyed, but everyone has been rescued, I understand. They have been taken to Municipal Hotel. Miss Minton was already by the door. Every trace of colour had vanished from her face. The Count's carriage is waiting to take us to the hospital, said the Professor. Miss Minton turned to the Count. Thank you, she managed to say, before she followed the Professor out into the street. The twins were crying. Their beds in Ward C of the hospital were close together because the ward was very full and they lay on their sides facing each other and gulped. It's gone. It's just gone. All of it's gone. There's nothing left, not a single maraise. Oh, maraise. The nurses had at first been very kind. Neither of the girls were badly hurt. Beatrice's hair was singed. She had a small burn on her leg. Gwendolyn had fallen on the gravel path as she ran out of the ho house and had sprained her ankle. But there was always shock and smoke inhalation to consider. And for a while, the nurse sat by, the, by their beds and tried to comfort them. Your mother's safe. She's going to be all right. She's in the next ward. You can go and see her. But the twins were not crying for their mother. It's our money, sobbed Beatrice. The money for the reward, 20,000 murrays each and it's all burnt perhaps you will get it again from the insurance but the carters of course were not insured and the twins went on snivelling till the nurse became impatient and walked away mrs carter was in the next ward her arm was bandaged and she had inhaled a lot of smoke even so she found time to complain about the way the hospital was run the lack of hygiene and the patients whose young children were allowed to visit them and run all over the ward and there's a fly on my water jug, she said fretfully. Two, in fact. She was still complaining when a smartly dressed Englishman came to her bedside. He was the British consul assistant. Mrs Carter, the consul has asked me how we can help you to return to England. There seems to be little future for you here. You mean you'd pay our fares? For you and your daughters, yes. Do you have anyone you could go to in England, relatives or friends? Mrs Carter frowned. She did not actually seem to have any friends. Then her face cleared. Lady Parsons, in Littleford. She would take us in, I'm sure. She is my mother's cousin. Well, almost. Her address is Grey Gables. The promenade, Littleford-on-Sea. The young man wrote this down. Then he said, not meeting her eyes. Your husband won't be returning to England just yet, I'm afraid. And as gently as he could, he told her that when he came out of hospital, Mr Carter faced a trial and possible imprisonment for fraud and embezzlement. Just as he had cheated the bank in England, so had he done out here. It was only Gonzales to whom Mr Carter owed money and more money than he could ever hope to repay. Miss Minton ran up the hospital steps and the professor, mopping his brow, ran behind her. The Carter family, she said at the desk. The girls from the fire, where are they? Ward C, said the receptionist, and they hurried up two flights of stairs. The twins still whimpering, but they stopped to stare at Miss Minton. You're not badly hurt, I understand, she said. I hope you're not in pain. Our money's gone, sniffled Beatrice. Yes, but you might have lost your lives and then... Where's Maya? The twins shrugged. Daddy went back to find her. We don't know where she is. She didn't come in with us. 
Miss Minton's heart began to pound. The professor put a hand under her arm. I'll go and ask the sister. He made his way down the corridor and came back with a set face. She said, she said there were only two girls and their parents in the ambulance. She didn't know there was another girl. Miss Minton took a deep breath, trying to steady herself. But Mr Carter went back for her. The twins say she, she must be here. The sister had come out of her office to join them. Now they all hurried to the men's ward. Mr Carter's burns were serious. His hair and eyebrows were singed. His face was swollen. Both arms were bandaged. He lay still with his eyes closed, but Minty had no thought to spare for him. Mr Carter, where is Maya? Your daughter say you went back for her. Did you bring her out safely? I tried, lied Mr Carter. I went right to her door, but it was impossible. An inferno, Miss Minton swayed. I'm not the kind of person who faints, she said, as the sisters moved towards her. But there, she was wrong. Chapter 20. For a few hours, the bungalow had been beautiful. Orange and crimson and violet flames lit up the night sky. Showers of golden sparks flew upwards as the fire danced and played on the dying house. Then it was over and there was nothing left. Only grey ash and those strange objects which survived disaster. The nozzle of a flit gun, a splintered wash basin, and in what had been Mr Carter's study, a single eye, cracked by the heat, staring creepily at the heavens. So when Finn sailed back down the Negro at dawn, he saw no flames and heard no roaring as the house was destroyed. Everything at first seemed as it had always done. The big trees by the river, the huts of the Indians, the carter's launch riding at anchor. Then the dog, standing beside him, threw back his head and howled. What is it? asked Finn. But now he too smelled the choking, lingering smell of smoke. And as he sailed towards the landing stage, he saw it. The space, the nothingness where the Carter's house should have been. Not even an empty shell, nothing. He had thought that the news of his father's death was the worst thing that had happened to him, but this was worse because he was to blame. If he had taken Maya as she had begged, he was shivering so much that it was difficult to steer the Arabella to the jetty and make her fast. There was no point in searching the ruins. It was so obvious that no one could survive such a blaze. But there was one last hope. The huts of the Indians had been spared. Perhaps they had got Maya out. Perhaps they would find her sleeping there. He pushed open the door of the first hut and went inside. Then the second and the third. They were completely empty. Even the parrot on his perch had gone. Even the little dog. A broken rope in the run outside showed where the the pig, terrified by the flames, had run back into the forest. There was no doubt now in Finn's mind they had let Maya burn and fled in terror and in shame. What would it be like, Finn wondered, going on living and knowing that he had killed his friend? The howler monkeys had been right to laugh when he said he wasn't going back. He had turned down river again almost at once to fetch Maya and he had made good time travelling with the current but he had come too late. Finn went outside again and stood on the square of raked gravel that had been the Carter's garden. His mind seemed to have stopped working. He had no idea what to do. Should he go into Manus and see if he could find anything out? From the hospital, perhaps? After a while, he found himself walking back along the river path to where he had left the Arabella. As he came to the fork in the path which led back into the forest, the dog put his head down excitedly into a patch of leaf mould. Finn pushed him aside and saw a smear of blood. Then a little way off, another and another. He almost fell over. Her, she lay so still, hidden in the leaves and creepers, almost as if she had uh, burrowed into the forest to die. But she was not dead. She lay stunned, still in her nightdress, breathing lightly with her closed eyes. The blood came from a gash in her leg. He could see no burns on her skin. She must have fainted from loss of blood. Then, when he said her name, she opened her eyes. One hand went out to his sleeve. Can we go now? she whispered. 
And he answered, yes. Maya opened her eyes and saw a canopy of trees and shining through the topmost leaves, a high white sun. She could smell the rich, heady smell of orchids and hear a bird whose single piercing cry came clearly over the puttering sound of an engine. Then the overhanging trees disappeared. She was looking up at a pale, clear sky and the light was suddenly so dazzling that she closed her eyes because she did not want to wake up or to stop. She wanted what was happening to her to go on and on and on. She was lying on a ground sheet on the bottom of a boat. They were moving steadily through the water, not fast, not slowly, the perfect speed to lull her back to sleep. She was covered by a grey blanket. She pushed it off and saw that her leg was bandaged. It throbbed, but not unpleasantly. It seemed to belong to someone else. She closed her eyes and slept again. When she woke once more, it was to find that something was resting against her side, snoring gently. A dog the colour of dark sand. So then she turned her head and saw, her, and saw behind her Finn, sitting quietly in the stern with his hand on the tiller and knew she was on the Arabella and safe. It was the Indian side of Finn that had taken her when he found her in the wood that managed to carry her to the landing stage and lay her down in the Arabella. That bandaged her leg and made her swallow one of his bark potions and then cast off, telling her to sleep and sleep and sleep. Sometimes the European side of him protested and told him that he ought to take her to the hospital for proper treatment, but he took no notice. He knew now what was best for Maya and he was right for now and as she woke beside the dog she was herself again the fear and exhaustion had gone from her face i'm hungry she said and smiled at him she'd escaped through her high window the gash on her let on her leg was made by the broken glass as she scrambled through the doors were already smouldering when she woke i don't remember much after that it was the smoke i think i know there wasn't anyone in the huts why not? said Finn fiercely. They promised they'd look after you. There was a wedding, an important one. They all went. And Minty, she went somewhere too, said Maya. She's left me. No. What do you mean, no? She wasn't there. She didn't come back from her day off. Maybe, but she wouldn't have left you. This isn't what will have happened. What about the others? They escaped. I saw the river ambulance take them away, but I hid. I couldn't bear to be with them any more. They were all quarrelling and screaming, so I hid in the trees. I didn't notice my leg at first, but then she shook her head. But it doesn't matter, Finn. None of it matters because you came back. They set a course back up the Negro, then, then turned into a smaller river, the Agapari, which flowed northwest to the lands where the Zanti had last been seen. It was a beautiful river. They travelled between small islands where clumps of white egrets roosted or clouds of tiny pearl grey bats flew up from fallen logs. What amazed Maya was how varied the landscape was. Sometimes they sailed through dark, silent jungle where all the animals were out of sight in the topmost branches. Sometimes the river wound through gentle countryside, almost like England, where swamp deer greys in the grass clearings. Once they passed into a patch of scrubland and saw a range of bare brown hills in the distance before they plunged into the rainforest again. If this is the green hell of the Amazon, then hell is where I belong, said Maya. She was completely happy. When she took off the bandage, she found a mulch of some strange green mould, which Finn put there and beneath it, a wound which was almost healed. You really ought to be a doctor, she said, or a witch doctor, perhaps. It's often the same thing. She had cut the bottom of a pair of Finn's trousers and borrowed one of his shirts, and Finn had pilfered a roll of cotton, meant for the Indians, from which she made a kind of sarong for when she was in the water. The nightdress she had escaped in had been torn up for cleaning rags. Everything she'd owned had been destroyed in the fire, 
and she missed nothing except her toothbrush. Scrubbing one's teeth with twigs was not the same. Okay, guys, that's all I'm reading today. I hope you have enjoyed and I hope you'll tune in next time. Bye.